After 10 episodes of Drinks with a VC, a podcast where you can learn more about the personal side of investors, Vic and the team put together a Best Up, where we showcase advice, ethics and investing, and of course, VC fashion choices. We're starting our Best Up with my favorite segment called Investors. In this segment, we gift our guest a one-of-a-kind Patagonia vest designed with the VC in mind. Watch and see who wore it best. Now, we know you're used to getting really cool swag at these parties. So let's go ahead and see. Yeah. Please. see what kind of swag Open and maybe give us a play-by-play. Okay. Box is currently being opened. The top slid off very easily. Didn't have to work too hard for it. Uh, And the reveal. Da, 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 is a oh. <laughs> could I please wear this right now? Yeah, please, please yes. do. Please wear <laughs> Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And oh uh, yeah, oh yeah. Is, there it is. Gorgeous. But it fits you it. perfectly. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. You're not going to believe this. Oh, it's not only is it a Patagonia vest, but <laughs> it is my favorite music festival. It was such a, such a success. I love being on the beach in the Bahamas. Actually, I didn't go, but I wish I had. Now you get to be the only VC with a fire festival vest. This is, this is arguably one of the coolest things I'll own. (laughs) It really is. I mean, think about this. How many people are running around the world celebrating the most disastrous music festival (laughs) that ever occurred? In fact, if you did go to the fire festival, I mean, I, I feel terribly sorry for, for you and, and your soul, but you probably wouldn't be wearing this because you're yeah. just, I just don't think you walked away with a great feeling about it. There was probably a bonfire somewhere with these in it. I, I think you've inspired future segments of ours to who wore it better uh, with, you know, Patagonia vests, but this is exciting. Oh yeah, it even matches oh. what you're wearing. Wow, oh, that I, looks great. I, I feel this is very natural. It just, I, for some reason, <laughs> I just, I, I feel like this is just, this has always been part of me, this vest. Do you it, think it, that Wei Ping likes us more or less for getting you this vest? I think she's probably halfway to Oregon by now. <laughs> I, think, I, I think I heard the, the car starting and I, I'm pretty sure she's gone and I, I, it, it's gonna it's gonna take me a while to find her after this. I'm not sure she approves of any of this, but on the other hand, I have this now, and so all I got to do is FaceTime her, no matter where she is, and say, "Yeah, I know, I know, I know." But look at this. Yeah, and this is that's how you know it's not me who packaged it. It any, was it was Reynolds. Okay, let's see. Any of our Ooh, five Patagonia. regular guests will know what this is. Yeah. Oh, this. It's your own vest, man. Look at the front. What's on it? A rose. A rose. And, you know, honestly, rose ball. We don't no, know. We it's don't the know final if, rose yeah, for that's our right. Zoom Bachelor. The final rose for the Zoom Bachelor. <laughs> that's right. That's you right. guys are amazing. Wow. <laughs> that's incredible. What does the vest say on it? It says Mojo. Yes. Uh, which, which happens to be one of my several stage names um, or nicknames that have been given. Uh, I, I'm assuming you got it, uh, you got it embroidered or did you, did you find it this way? This is uh, remarkable, thank you. No, this is a one of a kind vest. So every, every VC on our show, since you are an investor, <laughs> we get you a vest. Oh, <laughs> one yeah. that's one of a kind just for you because we don't want you going to a conference or Burning Man with another vest that someone else is wearing. That's the most embarrassing thing that can happen is showing up to a South by Southwest party with the same vest as someone else. True that. True have that. They have it all. Life story. Oh, look at that. Oh my God. But does she Are have her serious? own vest? This is <laughs> for the, for the folks IPOs. That are- oh yes, my for the- God. For the, I for the actually folks don't that are- have a vest. I'm like the only VC that doesn't have a vest. So Unbelievable. I'm on a Patagonia vest. Well, but now number one, you have a vest. But can you, wow. for the listeners that aren't watching us on YouTube eventually, can you explain to the listeners what what's on the vest? Well, 
I'm assuming that you're referring to having been at three pre IPO companies and is that right? right? Yeah. Okay. That is, so, that's correct. so that's correct. Okay. So I'm, I mean, can I wear this? I don't know that I can wear this and not have people be like, are you a douchebag? Well, first of all, you have it to came wear from it. us though. I know, yeah, but I got, us. But do you think people think that I did this? And I'm like, guys, cover it up I was a, part of, I was part of three really IPO companies and now I'm a VC. That, well, oh it's my the, God. Did you ever see Silicon Valley? Yes, of course. The yeah. Trace Comas. Oh Trace my God. Comas from- that's right. Yeah. The Trace Comas. Ah, that's amazing. Oh my God. Okay. That makes it better. That totally makes it. I didn't catch that. <laughs> that makes it a lot better. Oh man. And, this this and is so cool. I as seriously a matter of don't fact, have a Patagonia vest. How can yeah. I call myself a VC? Right. And this is going to be like a collector's item one day. <laughs> Patagonia vest with our rare breed logo, which actually, we don't actually have a logo yet. This is like a placeholder. So this is going to be like a one of a kind, like art that, that everybody's going to wonder about. But now I've never had one of these. So now I feel like a real investor now, like, <laughs> like it's real. I have I have one of these vessels now. Like it's it's a thing. That's so, all you need, really. It's yeah. it's just the vest at that point. It's it's all about the vest. Yes. What? <laughs> so I'm pulling over. Bring, bring this over here. Box and the V. Yeah. It appears to be a love. <laughs> oh my gosh! You kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, it's really funny because I just tweeted uh, not too long ago, which Vic and Bree must have seen. Uh, that I don't own a single Patagonia vest. And lo and behold, I got a Juicero Patagonia vest. How the hell did you guys find this thing? We don't <laughs> that find, is, we make. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> we do, we do. So that is a one of a kind uh, Juicero branded Patagonia vest. Is this real? Like, did, did, is this actually from the company or did you? It is, it is not real. And, um, you know, uh. we, we know that you would appreciate the irony of that vest and <laughs> wear it with, with ironic pride. It's wonderful. Uh, Thank you. You know what really kills me right now? is how fucking comfortable it is. <laughs> and like, I'm so anti-Patagonia vest. I love the company actually and what it represents, but just like the fraught nature of these vests. Yes. This is actually super nice. I am like, ugh, it kind of gets me a little bit. And I, I guess I'm now Patagonia vested. I feel like I made it. It's like my welcome to the VC world. Thank you so much for you both. Hey, Ma, you made it. Cheers to you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh my gosh. United Federation of Planets Starfleet Command. <laughs> you know, your your application might be pending with Artemis, but you're a member of the Space Force in our minds. I've got a vest. <laughs> Do you have a vest yet? We didn't know if you had a vest. We feel like no. this is christening you. Wait, this is no, I I I I don't. But now, yes. now I have a vest that I'm never going to take off. Yes. That, that is amazing. So, I'm going to put this out here. I haven't said this on any of our previous um, podcasts, but I want to, and I'm going to say it on this podcast with you, Tess, cause just because of what you said. We want to do an in-person fashion show with you in your vest called Invest. And it will have all of our other podcast guests also showing off their vests. I love it. Brandon has to wear the one you got him, which seems like a very funny shirt. Yes. Yes. Of course. Our guests are not short on practical startup advice. Here's some excellent pointers on customer acquisition, the five pillars of telling your story, and enjoying the founder journey. What are the, you know, fast of the team or the founder that really appeal to you the most, right? That stick out to you the most, that you look for and search out the most? Founders who are thinking very critically and uniquely about customer acquisition, experience, and retention. Like Mm -hmm. one thing that I learned, and this, you know, colors everything that I do, and, and, and I'd say this, like this thought process really comes from the early days of 500 startups. And so feel however you want to feel about Dave McClure and Paul Singh, you know, two of the founding members, you know, they've, 
they both have their issues, right? But when it comes to startups and understanding and evaluating startups, both of those men are really smart. And I'll never forget when I started my first company. So Paul Singh is from the, the Maryland, Virginia area. Mm-hmm. And I ran into him in a few places. And every time I would talk to him, he would always harp on, you know, this thing about customers and everything you do needs to be about customers. And it's not that, you know, you need to do something else. And really what he was getting to was if you don't know how to get customers, it doesn't matter about all the stuff, other stuff. It doesn't matter how great what you're building is and all these strategies. Every day, the most important thing you need to be thinking about is how do I get more customers on this platform to generate more capital? And really that customer acquisition mindset is so critical. I, I, I teed you up for that, Bree. You're welcome. I, I had to just take it. You just, you literally were like, here, Bree. And I'm like, yes, Brandon, outsource yeah. so, CFOs. There you go. Hi, Workland also. But, but they, I mean, right. It's a perfect example of, you know, checks and balances and having proper governance. And obviously you have a phenomenal institution with experience, obviously within the office of the CFO at Berkland that, that, that can ensure that, that every T is crossed. Right. So, yeah. um, and, and, you know, all the communication is there and, and everything's appropriate. So um, it's stuff like that. And, you know, how do you marry that with a fast growing startup that's, you know, hiring people and, 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 and executing on, on a vision that was unique and, 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 and but taking that and in, in where the Silicon Valley culture is go, be number one, keep going, go, 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 break through walls versus just taking the time to actually stop, reflect and get it right. Um, yeah. You know, build the right governance, build the right institutions internally or externally, what's the case maybe with an external CFO, for example, um, to ensure that you that you're um, that you're placed properly. Yeah. To be a really successful founder. Like I have a lot of emotional investment in precursors. There's days I want to tear what little hair I have out when I'm running this place. But we have three or four employees. And what I realized is like, you know, when you're the founder and CEO, you have hundreds of people sometimes whose careers and dreams are like professionally at least are like tied to decisions you make yeah and like that's a lot to manage and as the company gets bigger you're managing through other people and i'm just sort of like running a company is really stressful yeah. and it never gets better and the nice thing about being an investor is sometimes people bring me problems i'm like here's what i think let me know what you decide to do mm. <laughs> like it's your decision you're yeah. the founder and ceo here's my input i agree this is a hard problem I'm happy to talk about it as much as you want, but you have to make the call. And it's like, you know, when you're in a board meeting, you're like, we have to lay off 10% of the people. The people on the board don't have to do it. The CEO has to go back sure, and look those people in the eye and have those conversations and deal with the dread of doing it the day before and the like drain of doing it the day after. It's hard. Yeah. Now, like the, the things I do look for are kind of like the classic things. I test for team, problem, solution, market, and traction, which I view as to be like the five key pillars of like a really good seed story. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I want to understand like, why does this founder seem uniquely qualified to solve this problem? Like, why do they, how do they arrive at this problem? What kind of customer development? Like all sort of like those some classic things, but I just need to be 60% convinced in order sure. to write that, that 25K check. And then it's really in the course of that growth project and working with these teams for some period of time where we can get to 95% conviction which sure. allows us to get to justify writing that second larger check. Yeah. I think that if you make it about the destination, you'll be disappointed the entire way there because either you're not going to get there or the 10 years that it's spent getting there is going to be miserable and that will decrease your chances of actually ever getting there. So you better make it about the journey. That's, that's, that's the way I look at it. And if you can't, then quit doing it because you're probably doing the wrong thing. We at Drinks with a VC look for ethical investors who are respected in their community. Here's some clips sharing how values have shaped their investment decisions. Define your values, you know, just naturally she kind of like loves this stuff. So like literally write them down of like, what does the ideal person look like? There's, there's a song that, and this is a bit of a random tangent, but there's this like song that I heard many years ago by the soul singer named William Bell. It's called The Three of Me, right? And I thought actually it really encapsulates well, like the goal of this exercise. So in his hook under the song, the three of me, he says, last night I had a dream that there were three of me. There is the man I was, the man I am, and the man that I want to be. 
And the really mm -hmm. amazing thing is like when you define your values, it's essentially creating the blueprint of the man or woman or person that you want to be. Right. And uh, measuring like your daily activities, mm -hmm. your choices against this person over time, it actually makes the man that you want to be or person that you want to be closer to the person that you are today. It was also the same week I found out that my employer was looking to gain a contract with the National Rifle Association. Yes. And um, I, it hit me in the worst way. And I kept telling people, like I was telling my coworkers, they're like, look, if we get this contract, I'm quitting. And everybody's like, what are you talking about, Mac? You're not. I'm like, if we get this contract, I'm quitting. I started telling my friends and my friends are like, you can't do that. Like, even if they get the contract, you need to have a plan. You need to figure out what you're doing next. I know how to code. Uh, my front end skills have gotten way better. So like as a full stack developer, I'm more valuable than ever. Mm -hmm. Like I've done back end, DBA, front end. I know a bunch of languages. I got a skill set. I can get a job. I'm going to quit. And sure enough, two weeks later on a Friday, they rang the gong saying we won the contract for the National Rifle Association. And 15 minutes later, I took my letter up to the head of HR and gave them my letter of resignation. And in the letter, I told them, as a black man, I could not work for an organization that did work for the National Rifle Association. It became this whole big thing, right? Blew up. I'm not curious about making an investment that challenges my moral compass. There's like a, mm -hmm. a fine line. And I think ethics and entrepreneurship is something that's not spoken about enough that really should be. And that's not, a, if it challenges my moral compass or I don't believe in or I don't agree with, like I won't make that investment or I won't partner with that idea. Um, Venture capital and, and investing, I think is mostly about people. I think the companies and the technologies are a byproduct of pe good people doing good things, hopefully. And so the optimistic side of me would say, the relationships that you build with people in, you know, certainly in venture and building great companies, this is about organizations. And there, I, I've yet to see a really great company be built with a bunch of a-holes. I just, I mean, you can't create a company where people don't treat other people correctly. I mean, even in a really, really tough environment, like the early days of Apple, for example, for example, where Steve would just turn the screws really hard on people. I mean, mm -hmm. the culture within Apple was certainly influenced a lot uh, by Steve, but the there was this positive energy around innovation, right? Where people, it was almost like a almost like a collegial thing where they just felt you know, they were all in the same mission, and there was like this very positive spirit and. In, you know, when they were pulling all nighters, you know, night after night after night, which is the same thing that happens in many startups, it's really about those relationships and the trust that you build with mm -hmm. people. And so for me, the optimism comes from there are good people in this world and who want to do great things. And the best companies, I, and I, again, this is a little cliche, but it's never about the money. It's never about the outcome. We were talking about the journey before. And so if you truly enjoy what you're doing and you're doing it for the right reasons and you treat people right while you're building those companies, I think there's, that's a lot to be optimistic about. Even if you fail, you probably learned a lot and you built some really good, you know, some friends and some trusted relationships that you're probably going to carry forward for a really long time. So I, th I think that's a huge part of it. Um you know, I, it, it's a big part of why I wanted to start a firm too. Uh, I, I wanted to feel like we could build a culture that I was proud of. Um, and that's not to diss all the venture firms out there, but I just, none of them felt like what I wanted to be re represented by. And none of them felt like a good fit that I talked to at least. Um, and, and honestly, a big driver of it was the fact that I had already had a daughter. Like I had a almost two-year-old at that point. And it's going to be years until she realizes like what I've done and what I've accomplished. But I, I was very driven by the fact that like, I think she'd be proud of this. And I, I want to be, you know, a, a good example for her. Um, and I don't want my imposter syndrome or any of that to get in the way. Cause that's like, you know, like I said, with, with, you know, her reaction to there being a female vice president, she doesn't know any different, you know, and, and I just want to continue that. Um, tell us about the work you're doing with pledge and your thoughts on how to support more diversity and inclusion initiatives. So pledge LA, uh, I, the Anberg foundation came to me about three years ago and said, you know, we, we, 
you think there's a um, issue out there, can we you know, work with you and, and, and try to solve it? And it, we didn't know which way it was going to go, but I'm really happy the way that, you know, where it's gone in the last three years. But Blood GLA is trying to, you know, increase measure first, diversity and inclusion in LA in, in both um, venture funds and, um, and tech companies. Um, and then, you know, try to do something about that. And, and the, the first part we've been doing are surveys. We now have over 200 companies taking the survey. Um, we have, you know, just raising the awareness of, you know, this is what the landscape looks like. Now, the good news mm -hmm. is um, LA does better than most cities. And, um, and so we're more diverse, but, you know, our population is more diverse. So uh, right. I think we have a higher standard down here and, and we should. Um, and so I think we've been doing um, better. Uh, we just had a, a, a meeting this week, Pledge LA, and trying to figure out how to turbocharge some of the initiatives we want to do. We started a fund where we're investing directly into companies in South LA. Um, we have an uh, in internship program where we place interns of underrepresented minorities and, and uh, female interns into um, venture funds in LA. Um, we are just trying to you know, leverage the, um, the community here, which is very receptive to this and yeah. saying, you know, how can we help? How can we make a difference? Um, and so at drinks with a VC, we are serious about the drinks part. Take a peek at some of the funniest moments we had at drinks with a VC. And to show you how naive I was, um, I, one day I went to Gilman. I was like, there's a bunch of VCs who don't know who we are. He's like, what are you going to do? I'm like, I'm going to make a pitch deck on Incutel. And I'm going to go pitch a bunch of VCs. He's going to be like, I'm going to put my laptop in my bag and I'm going to go drive around Santa Rosa. I'm going to go pitch people on Incutel. Not knowing that VCs don't go pitch other VCs. <laughs> yeah. And I think because I was so young, they were like, this is hilarious that this like, young kid wants to go. That, I, I literally was like, oh, do you guys do that? I've never yeah. heard of that practice. That's I, but it's, a it's, new best practice, a Charles Hudson special. Yeah. And, uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there it is. Gorgeous. But it fits you it. perfectly. If this you're, is your how wife. Do we feel? You and your wife are going to be those deer on Vic's sweater tonight. Oh, yes. After she I, sees uh, you in that. Fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I really hope my mom is not watching this episode. Um, I got the scare of my life. I was, uh, the other day I was on the phone. I had two young women who were, you know, doing their thing, pitching me on an amazing idea that I thought was actually really cool. And as we were getting to the middle of the pitch and I was about to start asking questions, there's a knock at my door. Um, my mother, who I'm staying with because it's COVID. So I'm here to support her. So she didn't have to leave the house, goes to the door and there are two cops there. Um, and the cops identify themselves as being part of the drug and substance abuse unit. And then proceed to ask my mom if this was her house and uh, who McKeever Carlo was, which is me. And then asked me if I was expecting a package from California at which point I told them not from you uh, and I haven't bought anything on Amazon recently, so probably not, but what's going on? As I am freaking out, because every now and then I do get random boxes here where, you know, people I know decide to send me stuff or thank yous or whatever. I'm just like, who sent me something? <laughs> and then the cop proceeds to tell us, well, we have this warrant and, you know, we want, we've already opened the box. And at this point, my mom's looking at me like she could kill me. And I'm freaking out, like, what's going on? And that's the point where the cop's like, oh, by the way, nobody's in trouble. I should have led with that. You jerk. And basically what happened was they had a, a drug sniffing dog that alerted them to the box and they opened it and found my surprises and then had to deliver the box to me to let me know that they had opened it and gotten a search warrant to do so. So my two surprises have been unboxed already. Thanks oh. to, uh, you know, two wonderful police who showed up at my front door. Oh, Thanks, nice. guys. Appreciate that. <laughs> everything. At one point, I might have said, well, maybe 50% nurture nature. I, I, oh, whoa. You okay? See, she knew how it worked. I just knew that it existed, but she knew what happened. That's so cool. Oh, my gosh. This is the funniest thing. This is the bonus round. Oh, yeah. Where's my metal cap? Can Which we don't it? have a true or false oh, answer for. It's so not. It's not true or false. I want um, one. 
<laughs> She's like, where's my metal cap? <laughs> well, the, the craziest one I can think of is when we flew from the Moscow uh, on a 1972 Soviet era plane into Siberia. It was a five and a half hour flight <laughs> in the middle of the winter. And the plane had an engine problem while we were flying there. It started to sputter. And there was a Russian pilot over the intercom telling us something. And I figured it was probably, we're all gonna die. It, but the plane managed to survive. All the oxygen masks kept coming down, but that's just because the plane was so old that the, that the doors holding them were loose. And then every time the plane would slow down, all the empty seats would fall forward. So the plane would slow down and half the plane would, would just, and anyway, we landed in, six, in uh, three feet of snow because they didn't plow the runway in Tomsk, Siberia. And I didn't know it was three feet of snow until I got out in my sneakers and was trudging through the, uh, on the jetway to get to the, you know, the, um, the airport or, uh, you know, uh, there was no jetway. And that's when I knew that this is not going to be a normal gig. This was going to be a very, very weird weekend, <laughs> which it was in, si in the middle of Siberia. I mean, we were hundreds of miles away from civilization. We were in the frozen tundra. I mean, we, wow. seriously, I, I, if I didn't come back from that trip, even to this day, no one would ever know where I was. I, oh. I promise you. How many people were at the, the concert? Well, Tomsk is a little known town in the middle of Siberia that happens to be a university town. And so there's about, I don't know, maybe about 100,000 people in the whole town. And this club filled up with 2,000 people, believe it or not. It was like this five-story club and um, everything was going great until we accidentally shut the power off and the place went dark. And uh, I was really worried. The, the owner of the club walked up to the stage. I thought that was it. I was never getting home. I was going to be thrown out in the middle of the wilderness and some big bear was going to get me. <laughs> That, those, these were the thoughts that were going through my mind. This is the first time I'd ever been to Siberia. I mean, who goes to Siberia? Much less to play a gig. That is this is the ultimate way to accessorize uh, the turban. Okay. Oh, wow. Can I just do the rest of it with? There you go. With, yeah, uh, yeah. Go. The article about me as the number three seed investor was primarily about me having been in this Justin Bieber music video. That's the craziest I, Zoom moment that's happened for you. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, By the way, oh, this God. is a perfect time for me I don't to know that have I, a drink. I don't know I'm waiting for this. I don't know say this one. Um, what is the craziest Zoom one? We can um, edit it out. Josh, don't edit it out. <laughs> <laughs> this is the, the last gift. Delightful. <laughs> The, oh. the Caddyshack I'm gopher head cover. All right. Nobody worry about me. Also, this... I'm pretty sure Hank has a new puppet that he's going to be playing. <laughs> this will be this is a... up in a bow. It's a chew and... toy. Absolutely <laughs> a chew toy. It's uh -oh. not a club head cover. It's a chew toy. <laughs> he's so excited about this right now. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> we hope you enjoyed this best of and will join us every other Thursday for a deep dive with a new VC. Also, if you don't want to miss the next one, subscribe. Thanks and see you soon.